Hi, NA Physics. It's Mr. Neff. Hey, let's talk about closed, open, and short circuits today. And before we do, do you know what your plates do on Friday night? I'll tell you about those at the end of the video. When you were in elementary school, your teacher did an activity with you where they gave you a D cell battery, a paper clip that you were allowed to bend any way you wanted, and a little light bulb. And you were supposed to light the battery, light, or light the bulb up. Well, it's, we can do the same thing, although the, kind of the, the, the lesson's been, you know, the cat's out of the bag. We know what happens. But I can simulate that with the simulator from our friends over at FET. I can take a battery and I can place it here like so. And I can take a light bulb and I can place it like so. And I like this a lot because it gives you x-ray vision. You get to see those charges inside of them. Now at first, a lot of people will just try this right here. They'll just try to get the, set the bulb right on top like that. And it, it doesn't light. We, what we have there is we have an open circuit, a circuit where there's, there's no conducting path from positive side of the battery to negative side of the battery that includes that bulb filament. So that doesn't work well. Then what some people will try to do is they'll take the paper clip and they might bend it like in a U shape like this and they'll attach something like this. And now this is a little funny. This shows the battery catching on fire um, and the simulation running ridiculously fast. But notice the there's no still no light coming out. There's light coming out of that fire, but there's no light coming out of the light bulb the way there should. Uh, the problem with that is it's a, that's a, a short circuit. There's a conducting path from positive to negative on the battery, but there's no appreciable resistance. That is, there's no way to safely turn that electric potential energy into something else. So it turns into heat and it catches this on fire. Now, you might, you might say, uh, would that happen in real life? Well, no, only because when you were little, you de that definitely happened to some of you, but you didn't let it go long enough. You started to get hot and you said, oh, it's getting hot and you let it go and then you broke the circuit. So now instead, what you wanna do is you want to get a, a closed circuit that includes the, the bulb filament so that number one, we do get flow, and, and number two, we can turn the energy into another form in a safe way. And now, see, here's what we have. So we have our, we have our uh, complete path closed circuit from positive side of the battery including through the battery too, I'll notice, you'll notice, so that the battery is part of the circuit and it, the wires are, and so is the bulb filament. And so now here's where that conversion process is going to happen. The charges are uh, have energy and they're turning them into, into light in a, and, and some heat up here. You know a bulb like this gets a little warm. And so it doesn't happen in, at the battery level, not as much anyway, and so you, it is safer. You know I like analogies with gravity in terms of electricity. And I did a lot of those in electrostatics and I'm gonna to continue to do them in electric circuits too. And so I, I ask, why does water flow downhill? And I, I picked a, a picture of a house, a clip art of a house, and I, and I picked this one on purpose. Say, here is a, here's a raindrop that just hits the peak of the roof. And that raindrop can flow down this way. Now it might have to get its way around that chimney and eventually it can make it down to the bottom of the roof. Now, what do you have to have in place for that water to flow downhill? You wouldn't think at first, but you actually need the exact same things as we needed with that circuit that I just showed on the simulator. Now, years ago, I always used to say uh, there were two things. And then one time somebody in class raised their hand and they said, well, what about this? What do you, what, don't you need that? I was like, well, that's a good point. And I, and it, it sounded like a smart aleck answer at the time, but I've changed this, this talk so that I have that thing in there too. Why don't you pause the video now and try to come up with the three things. Okay, we're back. The first thing you need, which sounds like the smart aleck answer is water. Uh, that's really good, actually, really good. Uh, I'm going to say you need mass. You can't have, Without mass, 
there's there's none of the rest of this stuff makes makes sense. You need a path. A, a path to go from there to there, right? Now, maybe down the other side, the path is a little bit smoother versus here, the path included that chimney. And so there was an obstruction or a resistance. I use that word on purpose in there. And then the other thing you need is you need a difference in potential. Difference in gravitational potential. Because without a difference in gravitational potential, you can't access another spot in the field. And there, there you won't get any work done by the force of gravity. So look at this. I have two examples here. What kind of counterexamples, actually? Here's a puddle. And there's a spot in the puddle, but it just kind of sits there. There's another spot in the puddle, but these molecules, now I know they move around a little bit, but this water is not flowing over there. Why not? Well, something is missing. Remember what you need? Water, a path, and a difference in gravitational potential. It's the third one that's missing. The water's there, of course. The path is there. It could flow if it wanted to, but there's no difference in gravitational potential. Those two spots are on an equipotential surface. And so we're not, well, there's no gravitational potential, so it's number three that we don't have. Here's some bottled water. Maybe it's on a shelf, maybe it's uh, in your hand but it's bottled up. Is there water? You bet. Is there a difference in gravitational potential? Yeah, of course. Here's one equipotential surface. Here's a, oops, sorry. Here's another equipotential surface, but there's no path because it's bottled up. And so it's number two that we don't have. So you got to have mass. You have to have a path and you have to have a difference in gravitational potential. Well, it's true for electricity as well. Say I set up a uniform field by connecting this battery to these parallel plates. Now you know from last unit that we that creates an electric field in there and it sets up potential. Well, what things do I need to have? Well, just like water, just like mass, I need to have charge. Just like a difference in gravitational potential, I need to have a difference in electric potential. That's a mouthful. I could have just said difference in voltage, right? And the focus of all of this is I need to have that path. I'm going to call it a closed path or circuit. If I have all of those things, now I can get flow. Now I can get a light bulb to light. So just setting the bulb on top of the battery, that doesn't cut it. That's an open circuit no path from, from negative to positive. If I do this, well, that path does not include the bulb filament. And so that's a, a short circuit. That's going to make current flow, no doubt about it. Battery will go dead. If, if it lasts that long, it, it, it's going to get really hot, maybe even catch on fire. Instead, what I want to do is I want to do this. One. Now, what would happen is I would have a conducting path from positive through the bulb filament, very important, and then down the wire and then back like this. So that requirement number one, the charge, if you can remember what we saw on our, our simulator, we'll just toggle back over to that. When I brought the battery over, it has charges in it already. Wire, yep, charges in there too. Light bulb, yep, charges there too. And so the, some people think that the charge purely comes from the battery. Not the case. The, the battery supplies the potential difference, but it doesn't supply the charge. It supplies some of the charge, but so does the wire and so does the bulb itself. You see what I look at when I look at this? I see sort of a bike chain and all the links are moving around at the same speed. There's some resistance to this motion right here, right up in that bulb filament, but they're all there and they're all moving at the same speed. So you have to have that charge. You also have to have that potential difference supplied by the battery. And then you do have to have that closed path, that last requirement. Now, inside of the battery, we kind of look at it as an, as an abstraction. Chemistry types are going to look inside of there and look at that chemical reaction that's happening in there, which is great and I think is very interesting. But for our class, we're going to be 
focused on what happens outside of there. What can you actually do with this given that you had two dissimilar metals in there and they're being oxidized and reduced differently. And just to wrap it up then, what some, some uh, vocabulary that we had there today is a closed circuit, is an unbroken conducting path from the anode to cathode that, or the terminals of the battery if you like. The open circuit are the two kind of failures in this experiment. The open circuit was the one where the conducting path has some break in it, keeping the, char keeping the charge from flowing. And the short circuit is when there was no appreciable resistance in it, like that bulb filament, which is a place that can safely convert the energy from electric potential energy into something else. And so that charge is going to flow very quickly, and this can get really dangerous. And like I said, what did the what do your plates do on Friday night? They bowl.